Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Foundry Church YouTube channel. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you guys do that right now. That way you can stay up to date with all the content that we show through this channel. And also we have an Apple podcast as well. So if you wanna hear the audio version of what you're about to see here, make sure you go and check that out today too. If you wanna know more that's happening kind of during the week here at the Foundry Church, we post a lot of things on Facebook. So make sure you like us on Facebook as well. With that being said, let's continue our series. Listen. Well, we are going to dive in to part two in our prophecy series, and in jumping in, this is a bit of a character study. We talked about Jeremiah last week. This week, we're going to talk with and deal with the prophet Elijah. If you don't have much familiarity with um, characters in the Bible, you're going to hear about one who's kind of a stalwart. Elijah is, uh, well... As Ron Burgundy once said, he's kind of a big deal. Um, he's he's real well. I know you shouldn't quote Ron Burgundy, but it was right, and I don't back down. Um, he, he's this he's this kind of legendary figure in the Old Testament, and you're going to hear why today. You're going to hear why he is a big deal. Why it matters that we tune our ears and we listen to this. And here's what we're going to do: we are going to read some. You're going to hear some. I'm going to tell a lot of narrative scripture. It happens between First Kings. 17 and 19. So if you want to go back and fact check me, please do that. I would be honored if you would check into the Word of God more and more and just continue to do that because I will tell you this, in looking into the prophet Elijah's life, we see someone who stood up for what mattered to God. Remember, a prophet speaks a specific word given to them by God, and the word of the Lord, that word translated in Hebrew, the word of the Lord, is the matter. God's discussing the matter at hand, the matter that is closest to the heart of God. So we're diving in, and we're talking about Elijah tonight. Before we do, have you, so I know this happens in in marriage quite a bit, where I'm dead asleep. And Erica says, did you hear that? And I'm like, well, the wet spot on my pillow and my slack-jawed face buried into it says no. No, I didn't. But now I know something was loud because I'm awake, right? And the question is, did you hear that? No. No, I didn't hear it. Or, oh, this is, if you're a hunter and you go out to um, you go out to the woods, or you go out to the mountains, and you get there, you know, kind of pre-dawn, and you're sitting and you're waiting, and it's all exciting, and and you just and if you're there with your little younger, you know, hunters, and they're like, "Did you hear that?" Shh, no, but they did, you know, and they're so loud, they're like, "Oh my goodness, I can hear them." It sounds like a twenty point, and then like the sun comes up, and it's a very obese squirrel getting his acorn on. Right? But they're like, did you hear that? Oh, I bet it's a deer walking by. He wants us to take him home to the freezer. Right? And they're the constant question, did you hear that? Did you hear that? Tuning our ears in means that we're going to hear things and we're going to understand things that maybe are more than just the words. There's things that go with them. So I'm going to invite you, tune your ear, take a listen. We're going to listen first in 1 Kings 19, 10 to 18. Listen to this. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake. The Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. 
I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Haziel king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel-Meholah to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escape the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escape the sword of Jehu. Yet I reserve seven thousand in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. So that's the end. That's the finish line we're going to work to. We're going to start in 1 Kings chapter 17 tonight. And today as we dig into 1 Kings 17 and 18 and work our way forward, we're going to find ourselves kind of encountering this prophet. And it's going to seem like a lot of stories, but there is something going on very clear and very resident in the life of the people of God, in the life of the prophet of God, in the life of individuals and greater societies. I want you to join me as I tell you a story, not of my own making, but one from Scripture. In 1 Kings 17, it says this, that the Lord said to Elijah, It actually says literally, the word of the Lord, the matter on God's heart, came to Elijah, and he said to him, leave here, turn eastward, and go into the Kirith Ravine, east of the Jordan, out in the middle of the desert, Syria, in modern day Syria or Jordan. You will drink from the brook that I have directed, and the ravens will supply you with food. So he's like, oh, you know, that, like I said, um, I think in devotions, the original Uber Eats, right? This guy is going out to live kind of the hippie life next to a river being fed by the animals. They're bringing him bread and meat. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kareth Ravine, and he lived there. He lived there, and the ravens brought him bread and meat, which means somewhere west of the Jordan was a ticked-off baker. Who's like, what is up with these birds stealing my bread, right? Think of it. I mean, they didn't bake it. I just love this idea. So they're stealing meat and bread and bringing it to the prophet. In the morning, he had bread and meat and drank from the brook. And in the evening, he had bread and meat and he drank from the brook. Eventually, Scripture says that the brook dried up. Now, this is kind of fun. Who was the prophet who proclaimed that the Lord would strike a famine on the land. Elijah, he's living the consequences of his own prophecy. He's like, it won't rain for three years. And then God sends him to live by a river that's going to dry up because it's not raining. So he's living in the tension of his own situation. But the word of the Lord comes back and says to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, which if you look at Beirut, Tyre, Sidon. It's in the northern part of, uh, it's north of Israel and just south of uh, Tyre in Lebanon and in that modern day area. And it says this, and stay there. I have directed a widow to supply you with food. Now, widows in this day and age had no legal standing, no rights. They were in, they were socially, they were in a lot of trouble. Quite often they were beggars. And he goes... And he comes to the town gate. When he gets to the town gate, that would have been a place where the elders, the leaders of the community, would have gathered to discuss the business at hand. And there at the town gate is a widow, and she's gathering sticks. And he says to her, hey, woman, would you go get me a drink of water? To which she's like, sure, click. Drops her sticks on the ground like, seriously, can't you get your own water? But she doesn't do that. She sets her sticks down, gets him some water, and gives it to him. And he um, asks her, he says, um, you know, thanks for the water. Could you bake me something to eat? And she's like, and th- this is Eric's paraphrase, look, my son and I are about to have our last meal. I'm gathering these sticks to start a fire. I'm going to cook some of the last cakes I have left, um, little kind of loaves I have left, and then we're going to die. So probably not. 
is the answer. Kind of awkward. And this is something I find very kind of resident and interesting in ministry. God's going to do a work in her life, but he had to do it first in Elijah's. He did it first in Elijah's. Elijah was fed by the ravens. He knew complete dependence on God. So he could say to this woman with great confidence, don't be afraid. She's going to starve, and she's going to watch her child starve in the process. And he's like, don't be afraid. God will provide for you. Only first go home and make me something to eat, and then whatever's left, you guys eat. What if it's just a cruel trick? The woman believes him. And he promises that if she makes him food first, the little bit of flour and the little bit, little bit of oil that remain in her jars will never run dry until the rains return to the land and a harvest happens once again. And what we find in this is she obeys, she bakes him a cake, and indeed over the next number of months or weeks, Elijah lives with them in a room upstairs and she provides for him because the flour and the oil never run dry. God provides for their needs in this most miraculous of way. But one day, the widow's son, her only son, her link to life, this would have been the thing that gave her worth because she has a male heir to inherit the land. He gets sick and he dies. And the widow comes up and basically says to him, look, did you come and save my life just to watch me lose my son and live on without him? And Elijah says, give me your son. And he takes the boy, he walks upstairs, and he has this raw moment with God. Because he, you can hear the words. This isn't some ethereal story. This is a woman, and she's saying, what have you done to me? That's her question. What have you done to me? What do you have against me that you would preserve my life only to take the life that matters, that is the only thing my life lives for? What, what do you have against me? And Elijah carries the boy upstairs, and he lays him on the bed, and he cried out to God. He cried out to God loudly, Lord, my God, you have brought tragedy on this today, on, on this widow, on this woman you brought me to. I'm staying with her, and you caused her son to die. Like, there's a lot of human emotion here. There's a lot of tension going on in this. And then it says, he stretched himself out on the boy three times, and he cried out, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. The third time, the kid wakes up. Like, that's pretty amazing. Like, you're like, oh, it worked, right? My goodness, that's kind of new. It worked. And she takes him, and this is kind of a cool part. I like the tenderness. It says he picks the boy up. He carried him down the stairs. And he says, woman, here's your son. Woman, here is your son. Your son, look at him. He's alive. Now, I want you to get what this lady says back to him. Because this is an important reality for you and I in the church. She says to the prophet Elijah, she has lived off like that much flour and that much oil for, let's say, three months. And she's fed three people off it, right? You can barely make a batch of biscuits, but she somehow made it work. And she's lived off this, and she says to Elijah, now I know that you're a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. Now I know it. Now I know it, not in some ethereal way, but in a very real way. I know that something about you, it's not just true to meet my needs, it's true to meet everything that I feel. What you speak is a truth that I earnestly desire. The word of the Lord in everyday life is a critical thing. And we need to tune our ears to it because we know this. This story tells us that God cares about the most basic needs in your life and in my life. He cares about the most basic, fundamental needs in your life and in my life. And there's something deeply reassuring about the fact that God does provide. I have a friend and someone who was kind of a mentor to me for a number of years in the faith, and, and I feel like a lot of the times all he would say is, the Lord provides. And I was like, do you know anything else to say? But those words became kind of a bulwark, a beam in my life that just kind of say, 
the Lord provides. He provides for that which you don't see you need, but also the things you do realize you need. But here's what we have to do. We have to listen to his instructions and obey. What if Elijah said, no, God, I don't want to leave this brook. I've gotten used to the weird, you know, Chick-fil-A delivery from the ravens, and the bread's pretty good. Can you just bring water back? How, how sad would that have been? Right? He had to listen. He had to listen to the word of the Lord. He had to listen to the instructions. He had to go and find this widow and obey. But when God meets your needs, when God meets a need that is close to your heart, and he speaks, he does, he acts in a way that meets a need that only you and him really knew about. It's an intimate, close thing. When he meets that need, I need to invite you, to challenge you, to ask you to live a faithful life of finding out how God's going to meet that same need in other people's lives. What did he do to Elijah? He put him by a brook and he fed him. What did he do with Elijah? He put him by a widow and he fed her. How cool is that? That God does something in you before he does something through you. He's going to work something out. It's going to be a painful process, but it tells us this, that there is a word of the Lord in our everyday lives that is health and strength really to our very bones. God's prophecy in this story was for everyday, ordinary people from the bottom of the social strata all the way up. Ordinary people, and what is it? And this is what I think I love so much about this faith about the reality of who we are. It shows his concern for everyday, ordinary people like you and me. We're not kings of the earth. We're just normal people, hoping that God can help us not just get by, but live life with purpose. And it says, I'm concerned about your everyday, ordinary life. Obedience in our lives when the word of the Lord comes, comes from trusting in his character, not only to provide but to make useful your life, whether you think it's useful or not. So when we are provided for, we have to look for ways for God to provide through us because it's a place we know. It's a place that it echoes for us that we know what it's like to be loved, cared for, and provided in. I want to tell you another story. It comes out of uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. There's really three groups of people in this story. And I'm going to um, set it up like this. The, let's on this side, the prophets of Baal. Baal is a Canaanite deity. He's a lowercase god. He's a horrible kind of, he's an idol. I'll just leave it at that. Baal, prophets of Baal, 450 of them. With Queen Jezebel of the northern kingdom, and King Ahab. Very evil, wicked people. They had worked to close up the temple. Terrible things. Horrible people. 452 of them right here. On this side, Elijah, an almighty God. And then all around and encircling them, the crowds, the masses, like just groupings of people because... There was no, like, you know, there was no candy crush. There were no angry birds. There was nothing to do. It was kind of a boring world. You waited for crops to grow. You harvested them and hoped they lasted until you planted crops again. It was a different day and age. There was a daily grind. But when something was going to happen, the crowds turned up. Why? Because it was something to do. And the crowds came out to the top of a mountain in the middle of a famine in a desert to watch a big-time prize fight, the prophets of Baal and the monarchy versus Elijah and God. This was the war. It was set up. Okay, so you've got this kind of dusty hillside, probably a few thousand people watching what's going on, and Elijah gets up and says, you guys go first. You have honors. Go for it, right? When you golf, you get on the tee box, guy with the best handicap, they go first. You're up. Go for it, guys. You have honors. They build their altar. They put the wood on it. They put the sacrifice on it. But here's the deal. You can't light it on fire. Your God has to. So what they do? They began calling out to Baal. 
They began calling out. They began dancing. 450 people began having a small-time rave around a stone altar in the middle of a famine on the top of a mountain, and they kind of went crazy. They started cutting themselves. They were really having a hard time because Baal wasn't answering. So then Elijah proves that he would have been one of my very best friends in the Old Testament. He starts heckling them. See, I love this about Scripture because we always think like, the Lord be with you and also with you. No, no, no. Get, don't get this wrong. One of the great anchors of faith in the Old Testament was a great heckler from the crowd. He says, um, do you think maybe Baal's a little hard of hearing? Should he crank up the hearing aid? Maybe he can't hear you. Should you shout louder? Oh, that's petting the cat backwards. Had to make him super angry. And he's just like, yeah, I mean, you're louder, but it's not. Do you think maybe he's like asleep or something? Oh, can just, like, I love it. I would have been like, you know, but I, anyways, it wasn't there. But I can, like, I love this part of it. Then he starts, like, there's the initial heckling that's like, I don't like that guy, right? Then there's the cruelty that Elijah exacts on the prophets of Baal. You know what? Maybe he's on a trip. Basically say, maybe we should do this another time. He's away for the weekend. He's at his cottage, and they're just seething at this point. So they're getting louder and more dramatic. And then he drops the bomb of all bombs on their little party. He says, oh, maybe he's relieving himself. He literally accuses, he's like, maybe he's in the bathroom. You know, Bale's a little backed up. Well, let's give him some time. Like, they're losing their minds. Like, if I could have been on, like, any Old Testament mountaintop, you know, it wouldn't be David and Goliath, awesome as it would have been. I would have been here, and I would have been like, get him, get him. I love this kind of thing. His rhetoric is flawless. He's laying the lumber to him. They're losing their minds. After like four hours, they collapse in a sweaty, exhausted, bloody heap, and not so much as a hint of smoke. And Elijah starts building his altar. He builds his altar, and then he digs a trench around it. He sets the wood and the sacrifice, and he says, go get some water. It's a famine. They go and get jugs of water, and they pour it over the sacrifice. And he says, go get more. They do this three times. They soak the sacrifice. Now, I don't know about you. If you've ever tried to start a fire on wet wood, it's a magical experience that causes Christians to go to confession right? It is not fun. It is like, why does it only smoke? No, nothing, right? He soaks it. He fills the trench with water. He fills the trench with water, and then he steps back. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. He calls out to God, and woof, God consumes in an instant, in a big cloud of smoke and steam, it goes up in flames. From that phrase, answer me, Lord. Answer me. We'll talk about what he said in a few minutes. But imagine with me when the prophets of Baal practice their jaws stretching out, just like, what? 450 to 1, and he cold cocks them in one phrase. He drops them. It's over. And then Elijah tells the crowds, get them, get them. These people have led you astray. They're liars and they're thieves. Needless to say, there was about 450 less prophets of Baal at the end of the day. Like how, like, dynamic, how much humanity is in this, how much divine interaction. The word of the Lord comes to individuals, but don't ever forget that the word of the Lord also speaks on a societal, cultural, and even at times a national level. The word of God speaks intimately and closely, but it also speaks boomingly, and it declares the matter that is close to the heart of God for his people on a national, societal level. Listen to the words of Elijah. Because other prophets spoke for God, but I think what Elijah says in verse 37 encapsulates perfectly what's going on. Answer me, Lord. Answer me. That these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you're turning their hearts back to you. He wasn't like, oh, Lord, Draw forth thy smite button and curse these 
who are woefully sinful. No. He's like, God, answer me so that they will know that you're God and you will turn their hearts back to you. That has been the heart of the matter for God always, that those who are far from him would see and experience his grace and his goodness and would come home to him and would trust in his power and his authority. God's word is for individuals, but it's also echoing out over the societal realities, the cultural realities, the national realities, and the global realities. God's word is big enough to be both intimate and booming. And I love that about God. But we have to remember that when we talk about prophets, they're just people. They're just people. And Elijah succumbs to this. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets, and Jezebel said to him, if you're not like the other prophets I've killed by the end of the day, then I'm going to see to it that I fix that. I'm going to kill you. She makes a vow and a promise to kill him. And it says, Elijah was afraid. And he ran away for his life. Literally, he had just smoked a mountain. He had just seen the people of God have their hearts turned back to him. But because he was tired, he just took off and he ran. He ran away and he fell asleep. He like kind of got underneath what's called a broom brush, which its purpose was, I'm guessing, it was to make brooms. A little biblical insight for you. And um, so he falls asleep under a broom brush, and an angel wakes him, and there on a pile of coals is a loaf of bread baking and a jar of water. And it says, eat and drink, for the journey is great. He eats and drinks, and he falls asleep again. The angel wakes him again. There's food and there's water. He says, eat and drink. The journey is great. After he does this a second time, he gets up. He eats and drinks. And strengthened by that food, he travels 40 days and 40 nights on two meals. Okay, I, I couldn't do that. I like, I don't know how people are okay with this. Literally, God feeds him twice after a long work day, and now he's got to take a, like, you know, a foot driven road trip. 40 days and 40 nights until he reaches Horeb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave to spend the night. Remember our, remember our text earlier? We find Elijah in a cave. He goes in to spend the night. He's tired. He's worn out. And we realize that the work of the Lord is for our soul. Because God's going to do something in that crag on Mount Horeb. He's going to do something. He's going to speak something. And he says, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah had to be like, I don't know. I don't know. All the prophets, they're all dead. Everybody but me. Everybody but me has bowed the knee to Baal. And God says, I'm going to pass by. I'm going to show you me. I'm going to show you a glimpse of me. And the word of the Lord is for not only an individual. It's not only for a society. But there's a word of the Lord that sinks into our soul. It actually gives us this sense of calling, of purpose, of identity. And that calling and that purpose and that identity is rooted singularly in the person of God. It is not in what you do for a living. It is not in your skills, talents, or abilities. It is in the purposes of God that he has laid out before you, and the word of the Lord calls us to be what he literally knit us together to become. The word of the Lord is deep in us, and it can speak and move in the deep need of our soul. He knew Elijah was desperate. He knew he was tired. He was worn out. He was crashing. Have you ever seen someone who's crashing? Like I think of a toddler around 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve, and they're just walking in circles, and they're like, and they're like holding like a chocolate-dipped pretzel, and they're just like making noises and walking. like, somebody put that poor thing to bed. That is a child who is crashing. 
They are living on punch and like pretzel rods. And you see them like, I'm not tired, I'm great. And then they run in circles. And you literally, you lay them down like, I'm fine. And they're gone. Like you see him crashing. Elijah was crashing. His emotions couldn't contain the incredible highs and the incredible lows. He could no longer bear what was going on. He had seen God show up. He gave everything he had, all of his faith. And God showed up in a huge way. Yet that wasn't enough to sustain him because there were still people who just flat out hated him for what he had done. They hated him. There was a queen who wanted him dead. No matter the good he did, there were those who hated him for it. And he got tired. And God cares. You get tired. And God cares. You serve and you serve and you serve and no one seems to notice. And God cares. You love and you pray and you lay before God something heavy on your heart for friends who are far from God, for kids who have left the faith, for a marriage that is tanking that doesn't seem like it's gonna be saved or it ended up divorcing and falling apart. God still cares. Though you're crashing, God still cares. Not only is your service seen by God, God cares about the heart and the heart attitude behind what's going on. He understands that we are but dust. He gets that we are finite. He gets that we can't see it. And I think it's one of the things I love most about God is he's mindful of how we love our peaks and valleys, right? We love the highs and and we despair in the lows. But God cares. Regardless of how we feel about it, God cares. So we know this. God's message through the prophets is perfect. Whether it's an intimate word or a societal, cultural word, it's perfect. Whether it's for you or the country as a whole, it's perfect. It displays the matter of God, the thing that's closest to his heart, to the world around it, or to the person that is most important in that situation. God is big enough for both. The question is, are we a people who will stop and listen for a word that is spoken into the lives of individuals around us? Are we people who will stop and listen for a word that will literally shake the foundations of the nation we live in? God is still speaking. Are we listening? Do we listen when God speaks? If the life of Elijah tells us anything, it tells us this that we can't weigh ourselves against the success and failures we have in our ministry. We have to weigh ourselves against the word of the Lord. Did I obey? Did I listen and then obey? So church tonight, hear this. Hear this today as you kind of tune your ear in. Will you listen and will you obey? Will you obey? Because the word of the Lord is desperately needed in the lives of individuals around you. And the word of the Lord is desperately needed in this nation. The word of the Lord is desperately needed in the southern hemisphere of this world that is literally ravaged with famine and drought. The southern hemisphere, south of the equator. Australia is burning. Southern Africa is drought stricken. Do you think the word has the word of the Lord could come? For those places, to a dry and weary land. Some of us have dried out souls and we're tired and we're worn out and God doesn't want our service. He wants our ear. He wants to speak a word. He wants to reveal himself to us. Listen, church, to the word of the Lord. Pray with me. God, for who you are, we give you thanks. We give you thanks that it's not up to us to figure it all out but we can listen and know that the the God of the universe has a word, intimate and personal, but also a word that speaks on a societal level. So change our hearts first, God. Use us to work in the lives of those around us. And then change this culture 
and let us be a part of it. Do a work in us, Lord, that you want to do in this world so that we can be a part of it. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope that you found today's teaching to be uplifting and encouraging, but also very challenging for you and your spiritual walk with Christ. If you're looking for a way to prepare yourself for next week's teaching, make sure that you click the link below because that'll take you to our weekly devotions. And devotions are a vital part of what we do here at the Foundry Church. So be sure to do that. Thanks again for joining us and we cannot wait to see you again next week.